Hi, folks. Welcome to back to the conference, KellyCon 21. We've got uh, another cluster of presentations. Uh, last of the day before the uh, Three Wishes reception, which is uh, starts at 6.15 Central Time. That's a separate, that's a Zoom meeting. So uh, you'll have to uh, comb your hair or, uh, um, you know, um, turn on your cameras. Um, our first presentation is New Skills for Remote World. The evolution of instruction to become technologically competent with uh, Debbie Ginsburg and uh, Jenny Wondrasek. Ready? Go for it. All right. All right. So, hi, I'm Debbie Ginsburg, Faculty Services Manager at Harvard, and my co presenter who will be presenting by video is Jenny Wondrasek, uh, the Director at Capital. And when we're talking about new skills, uh, the skills you'll see us focusing on are the skills of being an ethical attorney practicing with technology. Uh, and this has become particularly important in the remote world. I'm going to set up the foundation and then Jenny's going to bring up some specific examples in her video. So we've, we talk about the rules. Of course, we've talked about rule 1.1 comment 8 technology competence over and over, but there are many more rules that are implicated when lawyers are use technology and when we teach our law students about using technology that they should know about. And some of the things that we've been trying to do as we've been teaching technology is integrate some of this um, either directly or indirectly into our instruction. So, you know, these can come up confidential information, rule of lawyer as advisor, role of lawyer as a supervisory lawyer, sometimes even non-lawyer assistants can come up. When we are talking about uh, teaching with tech, um, we are keeping in mind that technology is part of the business of being a lawyer, whether that's a nonprofit or a profit business, they go together. Uh, so when I talk to say our incubates, we talk about a technology plan as a business plan. We also talk about the idea of continuous evaluation, even when we are just talking about word things. Uh, Emily likes a quote that says, if it's repetitive and boring, you're doing it wrong. You'll see Emily Barney in the next presentation. And um, we're trying to get to the idea of to be a competent ethical lawyer, it's you have to be using your time efficiently. And there's all kinds of issues that you will be considering while you're practicing um, from hosting to training to security that you're going to have to be aware of when you are out there. So you, some of you may notice that I'm at Harvard, but before I was educational technology librarian at Chicago Kent. So what I did there is we taught a lot of, a lot of office skills, particularly Word, um, again, to help students learn to use their time effectively. Uh, we demonstrated redaction so they would understand the roles of confidentiality, timekeeping to keep track of fees and make sure their, our fee structures made sense. And we also emphasized the idea that there was going to be an aspect of continuous learning that they would be responsible themselves. And that could start now. We provided them post service so they can learn some of these tech skills on their own time and their own pace, because that's what they'll have to be doing uh, when they are working as lawyers, whether their state requires tech, um, technological competency or tech CLE or not, they're going to have to keep doing this just to be successful lawyers for all the other uh, rules of um, ethical responsibility they have to uh, have to um, follow. Because as I keep saying, law is a business and you need a plan. And this comes from anything that you might be doing. You're creating a new client intake form. You may be updating templates. You may be moving time keeping to the cloud. All of these have implications that you need to be thinking about. So let's think about some of them. A uh, big one, of course, is costs, the initial and ongoing costs. To the incubates, I mentioned the idea of your printer, and you get an inkjet printer, and you keep having to buy those cartridges. Um, and that, if you're not, even if you're not directly charging for the technology, does uh, impact your fees. So keep that in mind. What do similar organizations use? What are the industry standards? What does it mean to be a, a competent lawyer in your area? What does your bar association expect? Keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that you yourself as lawyers, law students, whatever it is you're practicing, will have ethics that go beyond professional responsibility rules. Things like diversity initiatives or environmental impact will be important to you as well. And keep those in mind when you are considering how you're using tech and how you're integrating it into your, um, your work. So when we're talking about tech, we try not just to teach uh, specific skills, 
but also these bigger pictures we've been talking about throughout the conference. Um, I know that uh, Jessica and Katie mentioned it in one of their sessions. So one thing that uh, we will talk about sometimes is if we want to host something in the, uh, ourselves or host it in the cloud. And maybe in a remote world, because we're obviously increasingly remote, we were recently remote before the pandemic, and of course that's changed everything. The pandemic, everyone is like, oh, the cloud is the place to go. But hey, let's take, uh, let's step back a second and take a look. There are some pros to if you're able to host and get away from the con of things are not accessible outside of your office that can be useful to you. Maintaining control may be something that's important. Maintaining um, absolute certainty that there isn't issues with client confidentiality may be important to you. You may be worried about vendors going out of business and losing data. So these are things that uh, may be part of even your remote plan while you are, uh, as you go out into the real world that you wanna be thinking about uh, things we're letting students know. Cons are obvious, uh, it's very difficult to meet industry standards. Um, they may require software, I already mentioned accessibility and setting up and doing the maintenance, particularly doing the security can be really, really difficult. Uh, you know, so, and it's not just pick one or the other um, because you may find yourselves uh, trying to, to navigate a path that's not always clear. Even with cloud, everyone's saying we're going to the cloud now because it's remote, it's accessible. Uh, we're all going to um, just be in the cloud all the time, and that's done us really well. But some, but not every. But as we've been working in the cloud now for a year, we're seeing some issues come up. Um, some things are great; they handle security, so Google can handle security and prevent uh, my stuff from being hacked by outside attackers much better than I could myself. Um, but that means Google has access to some of my data and some people are not happy with that. And, you know, the data can be accessed from anywhere. It's easy to share, but we all see technical issues. AWS goes down and now we're all in trouble. Or exam soft goes down. And location of the servers are something we talk about sometimes because, you know, there's the client, you know, while the vendor may be able to keep your stuff secure, if it's in a government space, where the government can uh, access your servers. So some people say, oh, we don't want our servers in the United States because the NSA can access it. Um, and we as clients don't want that. That's gonna be something that students, when they become lawyers, will need to be thinking about. So again, this goes much bigger than just Word, but the other issues that they're gonna have to be thinking about as they become a lawyer that we need to address as we are teaching and integrating. Issues for hosting in general. Are you purchasing or renting? Goes to the costs. What's the license? Does the license have any implications for your clients? You're the lawyer now, we tell them, you have to read the license. Is the technology accessible? And that does, goes beyond just screen readers to does, are you doing building a client por uh, portal that uses too much jargon or maybe isn't accessible uh, with, um, a, telephone, with a, a cell phone? You have to think about these things because it's your role as an advisor to be able to communicate clearly with your clients. Someone mentioned Richard Susskind's Oh yeah, um, all the lawyers are going to be using email. He was laughed out. We're all using email, but now we're moving from email to client portals because that provides even uh, more security uh, and clear communication. You also want to be thinking about how you're going to handle data in the long run. All the data um, and inaccurate data can have some real implications for your clients. You want to be thinking about these things. Uh, you might have heard me talk about security in other presentations. It's a big thing for that we like to emphasize to the students. And it's not just a, we want to talk to them about them keeping their own data secure using VPNs and things like that. But also, they are likely to be supervising others in their firm. They could be supervising other lawyers, and they don't have an ethical duty to make sure they're uh, concerned. So you'll see an example in Jennifer's. Um, presentation where something goes wrong and someone blamed it on their secretary. No, you are the lawyer. It's up to you for it to go correct. And you have an ethical obligation to do that. So how are, um, how is someone going to handle this all on their own? How are they going to um, make sure that all of this is, uh, you know, students are thinking, this is overwhelming. I can't do this. So we let the students know that this is what they're using the networking for. They can work with the ABA, local bar associations, local other organizations, or even ask their friendly librarians from their law schools for help. Maybe we don't know the answer, but we can help them point in the right direction. So making sure they understand they're not on this on their own. So 
these are the things we want them to be thinking about in a nutshell. The cost of tech has implications for fees. Whatever software they use has privacy and security issues, goes to confidential information. The form of communication is part of their role as an advisor. They may have to provide the training as part of being a lawyer that provides supervision to others, and even what they can reasonably outsource that may get into non-lawyer assistance. Uh, always interesting to argue, but something they'll want to be thinking about. So that's the foundation. And now Jenny, in her video, will be providing um, some examples of things that she's used for teaching that uh, will flesh this out even further. Hi all, my name is Jenny Wondrasik. I'm the director of the Law Library at Capital University and a professor of legal research and writing. I have been teaching law practice technology for many years. In fact, I think I have taught at least nine iterations of the class. So today I'm going to continue the speech that you heard from Debbie Ginsburg and I'm going to talk about the ethics of teaching tech in law and practice. We are going to use the same model rules that Debbie speaks about. Competence and confidentiality are probably the two that come up the most, but we will touch on the others as well. So when I teach my students law practice technology, I teach them that rule 1.1 requires that you know about the technologies relevant to your practice. So what you are going to use. If you are a litigation attorney, you're going to need to know about trial technology and jury selection technology. If you never step foot in the courtroom, that's not something you really need to pay as much attention to. You also are going to know about the technology needed to counsel your clients. So some of the topics that I discuss with my students are metadata, redaction of documents, how technology functions before you question a witness about it or use it with a client, artificial intelligence in legal research, and what devices are in your office that could cause client confidentiality issues. So for instance, metadata. Most of my students actually understand metadata mainly because of the files that they're working with. They understand that their Word documents have titles, they have an author, and they have general information such as that. What usually surprises them is that metadata applies to more than just documents. Photographs and videos, if you ever look at the properties, it contains everything from when and where the photo was taken to what type of device took it. The web pages, social media profiles and posts, wearable technology, and vehicles and airplanes. So this last one, a lot of the students struggle with, but we've had a recent case actually that I think brings it home to most people because most people have heard about Tiger Woods and his car accident. And the police in that case actually sought out a warrant for his black box in his car, which was tracking all kinds of metadata, his speed, when his brakes were applied, and it actually helped determine that he is not at fault. The next thing I talk to students about is redaction, and there's no coming out of my class without knowing about redaction and how to properly redact a file. You may have heard about the Manafort case where Manafort's attorneys actually thought they had redacted. It looked really nice. They had nice black boxes, but what they had really done was they highlighted black text with a black highlight. So the text was still there and could be copied and pasted. So redaction is one of those important things that I keep going over and over and over again with students because this is client confidentiality, this is competence, this really can lead to a lot of ethical issues. If you are not the one doing the redactions, then you also may be supervising another attorney or a non-attorney, and that's where those really come into play. So. No matter what, avoid super embarrassing redaction failures is one of my number one lessons for my students. 
I also talk to them about how technology functions. We don't have time today to watch this video, but I highly encourage you to go out and look for Jenna Lauer's Twitter testimony, if you have not seen it yet, in the George Zimmerman trial. You actually have a prosecutor trying to ask Ms. Lauer questions about her Twitter account, but he doesn't know how Twitter functions. He completely messes up follow, following, and follower, and he doesn't understand how each category relates to her account. He really needed to spend time on how Twitter functions before he actually gets up and speaks to his witness. Another good example that I try to show my students for how to, knowing how technology functions before you actually get into the swing of things is the cat video. We all know by now about the cat video where the attorney shows up to court wearing this cat filter and he doesn't know how to turn it off. And he's telling the judge, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. I am not a cat, but I am here to represent my client. I will give him props that he is still willing to represent his client, but he also should have taken the time to practice with an unfamiliar laptop. The next thing we talk about are which devices might be listening. Just like you should not go to Starbucks and sit there and discuss client matters, I teach my students that you need to think about what device is listening to you in your home. They might be talking in front of their Alexa unit, their Google Home, or Siri. And these devices listen to you. I can't tell you how many times I have accidentally triggered my devices during a class or a meeting just by saying their names. The other thing I talk to my students about is how to counsel their client about the use of technology. So again, are client devices recording client information? What types of records might be requested from a client that they don't even know should exist? Should your clients accept payment in cryptocurrency? All of these are issues that may come up in practice. One of the biggest issues that's popping up right now, tracking technology, that Fitbit, it's tracking your GPS, it's tracking your heart rate. Google Timeline is tracking your location and Apple has similar technology. You have log files tracking where you're going online. One of the biggest issues, particularly with all of the protests that have gone on in the past year are geofence warrants. So these are the warrants where the police come and tell Google they want to know everyone within this small radius between a very short time period. So we're starting to see a circuit split on geofence warrants and it's something to truly watch, but I know that they're being used in quite a few states. And I've seen mention where they're being used with the Capitol protests, although the US government has not acknowledged that. Cryptocurrency is also very hot right now. So your clients are going to be asking, what is it? What are the pros and cons? Are there legal or ethical issues with accepting a payment? So there's a lot out there that you're going to have to discuss with your clients. So you need to know these things. And some of the things that I hope you'll take away from my section and things that I emphasize to my students is that you need to monitor new developments so that you know what is relevant to your practice. You can't just wait for someone to come knocking on the door and say, this is relevant. You need to be out there monitoring it. You need to follow up on relevant topics. And I hate to say it, but client confidentiality trumps convenience. So adding things like multi-factor authentication for security, just because it takes an extra 30 seconds doesn't mean you're going to sacrifice confidentiality for your own convenience. Most of the time, I tell my students they're going to be fine as long as they use informed common sense. That is the end of my section. I'm sure that Debbie can answer your questions, but if not, or if you have one specifically for me, please feel free to email me. Very good. Thank you so much, Debbie and Jenny. 
All right, we're going to save our questions for the end, but please do put them in the Q&A or in the chat. I know people are dropping them in both places, keeping our eyes on both of those. Our next speaker is Emily Barney and Sejal Vaishnav, Practical Magic, Hybrid Education and Beyond. Take it away. Okay, not muted anymore. <laughs> I was gonna say. Um, yeah. I was clicking on the wrong button here. Um, so last year, our presentation with Debbie leading, um, when Debbie was part of our team, was Pestilence, Fire, and Floods. This year, we have a less apocalyptic, more optimistic tale to tell, our journey introducing a new LMS and a hybrid learning model all in one go. So a shout out to our faculty for embracing this change, our partners across campuses, and a team that work together in so many different ways. So in March of 2020, this is where it all started, in this room brainstorming. As we completed the spring term with our initial online strategy in place, we really wanted to take it further and improve the student learning experience. So we started stirring up this next storm, which was to introduce a learning management system to replace TWIN. In order to drive the change from TWIN to LMS, we got our key stakeholders engaged early on. The team included members from leadership, IT and AV, student services, library, and faculty. For fall 2020, our big goal was to use Blackboard as a learning management system for all courses. How did we make this happen in a three month timeline? The first step was really to get the key stakeholder buy-in, which we achieved by demonstrating the benefits of the system from a student, faculty and staff perspective. Once we got that buy-in, we engaged our faculty by communicating the change and made sure they really understood that training and support was on the way. We worked with our campus partners to gain access to Blackboard and started testing the proof of concept. Once testing was completed, we focused on creating training materials and having proper support in place for the transition. So to give you a quick perspective on our timeline, here are a few events that we've put together. In spring of 2020, we had no LMS. There was a lot of manual steps from enrolling students to sharing material and class setup. As summer, as we continued into summer, we eliminated the use of Google Meet and chose to use Zoom for all our online classes, which really helped us streamline the process. By mid-summer, we were building out our hybrid classrooms after working out all our nuances with design budgets, procurement, standardizing the equipment, we finally started to assemble these classrooms. What worked best for us was to make sure everything was plugged in. As we were finishing up the installs and testing, we started to add more training materials, classroom tours, and boot camps, where we further trained faculty on the use of Zoom and introduced Blackboard. Emily was our face of training, as you can see from this slide. Um, our faculty really did go through a crash course, so big shout out to them for embracing the change. As we moved into September, despite all of the testing and training that we'd done, though, there were always a few things we couldn't anticipate. So fortunately, having a great team in place made it easy for us to start troubleshooting when we ran into hardware issues that we didn't anticipate. So midway into the fall semester, our university announced campus-wide Zoom licenses. This sparked the opportunity to automate our workflow. And to initiate this change, we started to engage with our campus partners. You're on mute. Clicking this button, I think I'm clicking it too often, sorry. One other thing that we wanted to do besides working with our campus partners was make sure that we were partnering with our faculty and students consistently. So Debbie, when she was on our team, um, and I worked on a faculty and student tech survey that we sent out in October. That provided um, dividends as we were going into November. Um, that we identified that there were some things that we couldn't automate, like the transition from Twin to Blackboard, that, but there was still more support needed. And that ended up being helpful for general training as well. So finally, as we were wrapping up full semester and transitioning into spring, we assigned Zoom Pro licenses to all the members of the community, and we launched a university-wide automated workflow for our online platform. This really helped simplify course setup and access. So by January, we had a much more streamlined setup process in our training documents, and we were also paying attention to the feedback that we gotten from students 
um, both in help desk tickets, which I was a part of the help desk team as well, and um, via our tech survey to see that there were issues for our online students accessing the whiteboard in the classroom. So we brought in touchscreen monitors on the desktops and did a lot more training with pre recorded videos to make it easier for faculty to get started with the new semester. Of course, just as we ran into with September, we ended up with more troubleshooting to do once the semester actually began and students were in the classroom. Fortunately, having quick feedback from our faculty and students made it a lot easier for us to have their trust as we worked on troubleshooting. So while we were waiting on equipment to arrive, we were able to use all of our creativity as a team to find solutions that worked for them in the interim. By the time we got into March, everything was working a lot more consistently and the questions that we were getting from faculty were much more specific about how to use tools effectively. I also was going into the classroom to offer the legal writing classes tech training to help them with their assignments, so I tried to apply the skills that I was teaching the faculty to use. As we got into April, then we started having more examples of ways that other faculty, staff, students, et cetera, were looking for ways to get feedback from students or to host events and other content that happened outside of the classroom. So the tools that we had available that everybody was using for the classroom experience were also being used in other ways to build community and make sure that we were staying connected as um, across campuses, whether it was an online or in-person experience. By May, we had a lot less work to do with training materials because everything was working pretty consistently and that was great. So we were able to get faculty started and the questions that we were getting were much more looking forward to the future of how to reuse content. So this is where we started out in 2020. Noelle a mess, a lot of manual setup, touching multiple systems. By 2021, we now have an LMS and an integrated solution that is driven via Blackboard. The results, a seamless and simplified solution created via extensive collaboration and partnerships. Okay, unmute. <laughs> so now we're gonna tell the story from our team's perspective, but of course we want to name everybody who was involved. So it wasn't just ITS and AV in the library. We also had support from building and engineering to make sure that we had the wiring we needed to get the hybrid tech installed and that we had the student services and faculty support teams involved to make sure that they were giving us feedback on the usability and the skills that, and tools that we needed. So going into the hybrid classroom tech experience, I'm sure these sorts of images are familiar to a lot of you getting the equipment is place was a challenge and we couldn't have done it without our great team. So we want to name all the people behind the magic. So besides Sajal and I, we also had Sue and Alton from AV who are getting all the equipment in and installed and Juan from ITS who is looking for ways to simplify the logins and software settings. It also helped that we had already put a lot of upgraded classroom equipment in place. So all of those green check marks were things that were already in place. And then we were bringing in new equipment. Those are marked with the yellow stars, which you'll see in the future. But we had different types of spaces to install it in. So some of our classrooms were already pretty high tech or mid tech, but there were also some of these larger rooms that we needed to use due to social distancing measures. Our goal throughout was to have a simple, consistent experience for our faculty and students, both with our LMS usage and with our classroom technology. So here's an example of what you might have seen with the Cali 2013 um, conference at Chicago Kent or maybe next year. So the green check boxes, of course, are the things that were already there and the yellow stars mark what came in. The next slide shows the faculty experience. So we added the webcam, of course, and the second monitor to allow student faculty to observe their students who are joining via Zoom. The next slide shows one additional thing that we had on the desk, which was a laminated help document so that faculty could walk in and quickly follow one quick set of instructions to make sure they turned everything on and join their classes in a way that would allow all of their students to participate. Getting it down to one page took a lot of testing. So we had a consistent workflow that we went through for all classrooms, whether they were high tech or mid or low. And we were focused on simplifying, of course, as much as possible. So that included um, doing things like limiting it to one computer login so that we knew that all the settings across all the software would work the same way, installing Zoom and optimizing those settings to work for hybrid. And we did test for some tools that were more of an edge case scenario, like Google Meet and Blackboard Collaborate. Those weren't on our one sheet document because not as many faculty were using that. But our goal was always to simplify and improve the experience for faculty. So, 
keeping that use, simplified user experience at the center of all of our testing involved listening to a lot of feedback. So how did we simplify? Next slide. So the faculty and student survey were important, but any sort of feedback that we got, whether it was during live training or help desk tickets, anything like that, we were incorporating into our plans. How do we simplify this as much as possible? We also look for ways to use projects and larger teams at the school to share the load of work and remix our training as we got feedback about what would be most useful. Continuous improvement is always our goal, so we keep repeating surveys. Here's an example of our student tech survey. It helped us identify which was consistent with what we were hearing from help desk tickets, which again, I was on that as well, that there were AV issues and sometimes there were faculty training issues. But then we could see that there was also positive feedback from students about the usefulness of the online classes and the tech team. Faculty feedback included things like the training was great, but it was too much and too soon so we wanted to look for ways to improve that. So one project that we took on that I mentioned in November was the Twin to Blackboard project. There was no automatic way to do this. So we worked with the library team. So here we have Shauna and Mary who helped me export all of those links and files. And Debbie worked with Rosa and faculty support to make sure that we were figuring out what we needed to do to get the content from Twin into Blackboard to increase the buy-in for Blackboard as our central LMS. My part of that process was as I got that content from the different staff, I was putting it into a few of these classes. We had a lot of faculty who were already comfortable with Blackboard and wanted to start from scratch. But since I was already doing some of this manual work, I just recorded my own process, narrating my setup as I did so, and broke it down into very short videos. So most of these were one or two minutes long. And the next slide shows that we ended up with about 46 training videos that were viewed over 600 times by faculty. So that doesn't mean that they watched the entire video, but they could quickly go back and review this. And the overall feedback we got um, was one of this, this was my favorite email that we got when um, our whole team, Sajil and I, along with Debbie and Sue, were nominated for a Staff Excellence Award, and we got a lot of congratulations, both from faculty and students. One faculty member said that the, he was worried going in, but it could not have been easier. So that's really the magic that we were aiming for. Again, as I mentioned, I also tried to apply the same skills that we were emphasizing. Um, the faculty use for the students. So I went into all of the legal writing two classes for our first year students with their big assignment. And I created videos. I broke down my normal presentation into short snippets so that they could view any time. And then I joined them for live classes that could be much more focused on Q&A. So a little bit of a flipped approach. Um, I also went back, yeah, we used all these graphics for our um, end of year library report. So that's why I have all this data. Uh, I see a comment about that. Um, and yeah, we did want this to be something that could be used in any class. So that's something I will be taking these videos out of the course websites from spring 2021 and putting that into our LibGuide and then reusing it, of course, for future classes as well. So last step, we did more surveying of our faculty. And we found, um, I really want to emphasize those green and gold bars. Those emphasize the skills that faculty are feeling pretty comfortable with after two semesters of online learning with the whole stack that we were emphasizing. Um, we do see some gray there and red. Those are areas to grow. We do know that some faculty co-taught, so not every single faculty member was engaging directly with things like their course website or Panopto. Some faculty were doing a lot of work with it directly and some people weren't. So what are our future plans? We want to identify the faculty experts because faculty always love listening to each other talk about what worked and what strategy they trust that like if it worked for them, I can do it too. I want to build more workshops based on the skills that I use myself, make sure that I emphasize how that worked and look for data for student success. So we always want to pull out what do we can we prove actually was used and what was most beneficial for our students. Of course, we've done all this work with training and documentation. There's always upkeep to do with that, but it's easier once we already know what people prefer to use. So overall, the magic is working. Getting feedback from faculty and students helps us build trust. Our teamwork has allowed us to build creative solutions and trust with each other. And that gives us a lot of confidence for facing future challenges and initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. You guys stop so fast. All right. Thanks so much. Very good. And our final presenter is uh, David Dickens and Hong Ka. I hope I pronounced that correctly. On Yaks, yet another COVID strategy, a Yaks section. <laughs> oh, wow. Long day, but good day, right? So we got, I, I just want to take a moment to 
be so grateful to see all of you again, as it were, um, <laughs> a few of you <laughs> uh, again, and uh, hear a few voices uh, from the olden days, as it were. Uh, I haven't been around a long time. Um, it's been a while since I've gotten to see so many of you, and I've uh, hopefully got a chance to connect a little bit. And uh, I'd like to, through this presentation, uh, with help of Hong Kong, give you a chance to get reacquainted with what we're doing at Pepperdine and see in our experience, perhaps some things that, that you've experienced over the last year and a half with your own uh, COVID strategy. Uh, I am the Director of Operations for Information Services, so my responsibility is making sure the tech goes and that um, the vendors show up and do their job and that there are all the resources available. Uh, Hong is the actual shepherdess of faculty and she, as the director, Associate, Associate Director of, of Instructional Technology Services, is going to bring the faculty into the place where they can be to actually use all the stuff that we put into place. So, teamwork, right? So, I come from olden days, olden days and olden memes, uh, olden times and olden tech. Um, Pepperdine is not ever been a tech centric place. It's been a place where uh, Phil and I used uh, duct tape and bailing wire for years. I let's see, when did I first get to Kelly? 98, something like that. Anyway, um, it's been a long time and and our experience coming through these last 22 years has been how can we find a way in um, an institution which has core values that we want to align ourselves with, how can we bring technology into alignment with those core values and sell people on the idea that um, this is, is not what technology in a classroom should look like. And at one time, this was high tech. I mean, uh, that phone on the wall uh, was a hotline and you picked it up and a nerd would answer and run down and fix whatever your problem you were having with the VCR that's attached to the wall, right? So that was, that was, that was a major upgrade, right? But if we would have been in this position um, when COVID struck, uh, it would have been a truly disastrous. But fortunately, we weren't. We had a few things that happened. First of all, um, a gentleman by the name of Caruso came along and granted us um, some money to take a serious look at what uh, was going on in the main central areas of the building. Um, there in our main atrium and auditorium, multi-use auditorium space. And well, along with that money came an opportunity to address some fundamental technology deficiencies in those areas and set into motion uh, some improvements that we would be able to leverage, uh, getting faculty more acquainted with tech and showing them how using tech could get them to the place where they want to be with the things that they actually care about, which is the students and student success and student relationships. Um, and building the community and, and other things which are so central to what Pepperdine's really about. Um, this really kind of fell, uh, fell into our lap. Um, I don't know about you guys, you know, some people uh, have great uh, budgets uh, for hardware and software every year. Um, we've got money to fix things, not always money to build things, but this gave us the opportunity to at least start making things look nice and appealing and inviting to our faculty and gave us the opportunity to, to reassess and redevelop our PR campaign when it came to showing these faculty what they could do, how the classroom experience could be lifted with the addition of technology. And I think that's just a part of the process. It has to look good for people to be excited about it. Um, it is a people place. Pepperdine is, and um, we love our people, and that's our strength. And we want to be able to be in a place where everyone can come together. We we can actually look professional on occasion. It's important to do that though too. I want to say these things because most of the time, what people think of when I think of the Pepperdine is they think of this view, and it's a gorgeous view, and it is a lovely place. But this doesn't get people educated. 
this doesn't move the ball. This doesn't get people to pass the bar. This doesn't get people to get a job, right? So we need to do better than that. So along with this money that we got from uh, a, a great donor, a fantastic guy who's invested a lot in our, our community, we also had one of these. Um, now, so the uh, construction happened in 2017. This happened in 2018. This was a watershed moment um, in all of the previous disasters that we had had uh, in Malibu. We've had mudslides and we've had fire before, but this was a particularly spectacular mess and a mess for a long time. It really forced us with some of this new technology that was available and some of the visibility of the technology that was available and some of the uh, people who'd cut their teeth a little bit on some of that technology to begin to show people that they could create a community through the technology. They could maintain their relationships and their teaching uh, presence and uh, through the technology. And for the first time, people began to become comfortable with the idea that something like teaching a class online, something like running their office online, um, uh, their department online, um, even running events, uh, which we've done last year online, was even a possibility. This were an in-person place. Um, you couldn't get, as you can see by the, the Black Hills here, you couldn't get to be in person. Um, we did have one other development that also happened uh, concurrent to these two and sort of underneath. And we had the great fortune to work with uh, two you um, in getting a number of additional programs, uh, uh, non-JD programs into an online space. Uh, there were just a few faculty interested in this at first, but it was enough um, to plant the necessary seeds to get that, uh, forgive me for using the, the word cohort together, uh, of key faculty members. Uh, some of them were already technologically uh, savvy. Some of them were just excited about the possibility of working on these new programs. Um, and and two of you really uh, created a great opportunity for a positive experience. I, I'm kind of giving them a bit of a shout out here uh, for developing class materials online. The truth is, on some level, two of you is like a WordPress blog and Zoom. I mean, on a certain level, that's kind of what's going on. There's more than that, obviously, but there's like that. But it was handled in the right way, and the development of the technology and the training of those faculty was handled in such a way. It really gave us a leg up concurrent to the major construction and the fire necessity to have just enough faculty to talk about doing something crazy like running our entire school online because the state of california particularly la county particularly the education um, group in la county COVID response was being terribly strict about what we could expect to do even if we could get back into place and in person which is really where we wanted to be anyway so we had to have a plan this is the plan this is ultimately what we were hoping to be able to do. We, we, it's great we had to you. It's great we had the fire. It's not great that we had the fire, but you get what I'm saying. We had these experiences under our belt. Those are great. But we had to be able to make sure that if Zoom was working for all these, you know, uh, makeshift classrooms in the cloud and everyone was going to do an online thing, we had to make sure that if there was any way to get people back into the building and together, Remember, together culture, people culture, beautiful views culture, we want to be all together. We had to do it and still maintain all the things we had to do with social distancing and um, the plexiglass and all the things that you guys have dealt with, right? There was no way to do that with the way of the, the capacity of our rooms were. We had to be able to extend the capacity of our rooms to support that the community if they were going to be back in person. So what we had to do is create a chain, and there was really not a lot of... Um, off ramps on this freeway it was more like a train on a track because everything had to pass through zoom one because now everyone's familiar with zoom right because everyone was using it for remote classes but also because zoom we got uh, some great work about um now it would be about 13 months ago uh and and then uh, uh, 12 months ago and 11 months ago in that period here uh last year some great work with panopto and zoom and long sight Long site does our uh, Sakai support, and we were able to get all these people in a room together with our IT folks and develop a way that we could accommodate 
um, both religious accommodation and disability accommodation uh, recordings that we were, were doing in Panopto through the Zoom recording system and all that connected and dialed right into Longsight. This created a situation where everything was dependent upon Zoom. That, that, that's our community was was already uh, trained and useful to it, but also the technology was all tied into it. So what we decided to do was bring Zoom into the classroom and make it the centerpiece of the technology. It meant putting away all the other stuff, but creating a situation where Zoom, right, Zoom could be the back end so that we could have a remote classroom and a in-presence classroom in the same building at the same time being simultaneously taught by the same professor. That way we could split out the total number of students in a, in a classroom so that some of them could be in another room um, while the professor was in the first room. And basically the, the long and short of it is this, it's just like running Zoom with having an extra monitor at home. You're watching all your students on one monitor, you're watching your presentation on your monitor. Now we needed to add some confidence monitors in the classroom um, to allow the professor to not be tied down completely to the lectern and uh, to make it a little easier for some of them to see because of course if you're trying to show a camera image of another classroom, right, this is not just a bunch of Zoom pictures on a screen, it's a whole classroom full of people. You really need to blow that image up as much as you can. So we had brand new HD cameras with wide angle lenses. We had um, uh, dialed in in every room and we had these confidence monitors all set up so that a faculty member could really see and interact and uh, with students in the other room. And we added uh, digital signal, signal processing um, in the back end because of course, like Zoom can work like this, right? It can noise cancel here just fine with my um, microphone, although sometimes it's better to have the headset on even with your laptop. But picking up sound from a room, going through program audio, it's a ginormous mess. You have to have some help. So our AV vendor, uh, vendor brought in some dig digital signal processing uh, into the mix. And with that in place, we're able to have what amounts to telepresence, right? A full duplex experience in both classrooms. Um, this this could be shifted back and forth. The different rooms could be used in different ways, depending upon the, the total capacity concerns. Um, these uh, the, you can see some confidence monitors here. Um, uh, we've got backup mics, a lapel mic and a handheld mic, um, to make sure that even with the limitations of Zoom and uh, the audio in the room, if someone really needs that extra edge of fidelity, we can use it. So the professor could uh, strap on the, the um, lapel mic for extra fidelity for the remote classroom. And the handheld mic can be passed around uh, and wiped off uh, if, if need be, uh, COVID-wise, uh, for the remote room, right? We did know that we did need a teaching assistant in these remote rooms to help facilitate uh, operating the Zoom from the other the other room but it's really as simple as professor sits down goes to the lms just like they would at home they're starting their zoom for a class start up their start up the lms start up their zoom me in the lms but they're doing it in the classroom and boom bob's your uncle there's a there's someone in the room um doing their the ta in the other room doing their thing it's great the key here is that uh, the technology that what we had available in the rooms was able simply with a basic upgrade to get us where we're going um, I want to give Hong, though, an opportunity to say a few things because her experience was, okay, fine, what do I actually do with this, right? How do I actually get the faculty to interact with this stuff? Hong, you want to tell a little bit about your story? Just uh, real, real quick. Um, we did a lot of Zoom training, so they had to be in the student seat. So when everything started happening and everything was fully online, um, I did... Uh, Zoom training all day, every day, and um, anything that was trained was immediately posted on our Law Tech site, and um, we provided video training as well. So it was just me, um, a part-time staff person, and a student worker. Um, so all the uh, full-time faculty as well as the adjunct faculty um, got training the same way. Um, it was a success uh, for how short of a time we were just ad hocing everything and everybody was so graceful um everybody just kind of hopped on and and did it so it was uh i think it was 
a little exhausting, but it was also exciting because it pushed us forward to where we're at now. And a lot of people are a lot less afraid of technology and they're uh, more willing to try something new. And for that, I'm grateful. I just want to share, um, I know we're running a little long here, and uh, that's because you can never let me just start talking. It's a terrible thing. No, I'm kidding. So here's the thing, right? Um, I just want to say one one last little bit here. Uh, thanks to Hong and thanks to the work that she did, um, we are we are very happy to say that there was no earth shattering kaboom. Everything worked out uh, so far. Uh, great accolades for her and the folks she's been working with. Um, um, it's 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 hard to get um, everyone that we'd like to thank uh, under the the list here. I want to make sure that our own team and with Scott and, and Gilbert and Phil, of course, you got maybe you may remember Phil uh, out there um, out there. They did a great job. Uh, Kirsten uh, Leisner and and the the library team was important to gain everyone back online. Um, uh, the faculty secretaries were fantastic. We just have a lot of people uh, that partnered with us and helped us move this forward. And I just really appreciate uh, each and every one of them and the contributions, uh, the Dean suite, we had some great work over there too. So um, we pulled it off. You pulled it off, Hong, you did. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for all the work you guys did. Very good, that's great. Three great stories. Not a lot of questions coming in, but I got a, I got a, I got a tough one for you because we got a few minutes to. Burn. We did answer uh, a couple of them already, so if you want to read the responses for anybody who's having trouble, that might be worth it. Uh, they can read the they can read the chat themselves, right? I'm not going to read the screen to them, but but that's but that but you're right. You did already answer the questions. Thank you for that. Um, so so um, 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 so so let's pretend for a moment. Um, just found out there's a. Uh, um, Another variant of COVID coming, you know, that that that's coming out of some country that isn't doing such a good job on its vaccination. Looks like we're going to have to close down. Um, not this year, you know, it's not going to hit the United States till next year. You've got a you've got a year from this fall, but but there's a good chance that we're going to be shutting down once again due, a, due to the next pandemic. Um, what 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 are you thinking? What are you thinking right now that you that you need to do to prepare? Or... Make sure faculty have consistent tech. Um, before they go home. <laughs> That's always a huge challenge when we see the range of things that people have to work from. I think a lot of it is also to make sure that students have accessibility. A lot of our um, students were facing internet challenges. Um, so the law school had some hotspots on hand, but to see if there's any opportunity to expand. I know there's certain companies that do expand out of your own internet. Those are those, those Pico cell or Femto cell hotspot you can buy for $129 or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. How and do those work out? To, they worked. We had um, some Sprint MiFi devices. They worked out. Our students took us on that. Our faculty took us on that and took some home in the, especially the rural areas where internet was flaky. But we also trained a lot of the students on you know, just disabling electronic devices or cutting out the video. So it's really a lot of consistent training so they don't forget these technologies that we put in place and to somehow blend it into, you know, if we're two years out from another pandemic, make sure we're continuously using the tech that we've put in place. And then Emily had mentioned um, the pedagogy and, um, the, you know, getting those teachers that we're, we're doing things on board. And we've heard in this conference, all these interesting things from escape rooms to more escape rooms. Um, <laughs> and I've cut my video because I was having internet connections problems. So, you know, we're, we're learning those technologies, but I think focusing on some of the pedagogy, I know you guys, Kelly's doing yet another um, course on it. And some of our faculty did attend that um, from Chicago Kent, um, but I think making that more seamless, not just trying to replicate the classroom um, in an online environment, but take more advantage of what the online environment can do um, and really try to understand how students interact with it and what stresses them and what doesn't. So uh, more attention to that. And if it's hybrid, uh, as Pepperdine was doing, pay attention to those sound issues. Emily and Sajel knew very well what they were dealing with, I remember. Man, sound is so important. 
if there if there's and I, and I agree with David as a as a whole, and, and I know this is this is a a, a wild a, a hand wave, you know I I give I give the the legal education world you know a a, a B plus. <laughs> oh wow, you're you're more. <laughs> Maybe a B minus. I don't know. Yeah, right. and, and, and and that's that's trying to take everything into. It. Now I know there's a yeah, lot sure. of students struggled really hard and, and stuff like that. But there's one area I give them a C or a C minus, and that is why why not more asynchronous? I mean, if all this connect mm -hmm. connectivity is going to be a problem, why not just have the faculty record their lectures, stick them up on the website, you know, and and deal with the students through non synchronous sort of uh, uh, modalities. Um, and, and I'm not just saying that because of Cali lessons. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, I, but yeah, I think you're, I think you're running up against something that w just has been this perennial conversation about how we teach law. And yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, we don't need to go all over like uh, Socratic method again and again and again. But I mean, there are certainly reasons why people think certain uh, certain learning styles are essential to building the brain of a lawyer kind of thing and the way you're supposed to think. And they just don't think it can, there's a lot of people don't think it can be done any other way. And now I've seen some faculty do flip, flip classrooms and do some great work, uh, at least getting that far along with asynchronous. But, um, you know, that's more, you know, the faculty's understanding of the tech than than mine. I see it working. I just prefer to be in person, and I just prefer the value added, the relationships that are built, the experience that's had. I I I, I want to see you in the hallway at the Cali conference. You know, uh, I don't want to just uh, get a chance to talk to you for a few moments here. You know, no, I, I want to give you a hug. Yeah, no, yeah, it's it's important. Human being, human touch, and and of course. What the lawyers are going to have to do is go out and do the same thing for their clients anyway, right? They they need to be in contact. And some of my friends are lawyers really struggled this year with feeling they weren't able to serve their clients in Sorry, a sense David. just because they couldn't be in person, because they couldn't visit them in in their in the time of need and to be with them as a counselor in, in the deeper sense of the term. And for yeah. our faculty who are very discussion based in their classes, asynchronous does not allow the sort of problem solving collaboratively that you want without a lot of work on discussion forums. And as other presentations have noted, that yeah. can be very challenging. That's not something that translates as quickly. Faculty who use breakout rooms consistently, who planned to put some of their stuff in a sort of flip format. I know we've got Alex Ravenall on our team who does a lot of creative um, teaching. Um, he's present here today. So we've got some great faculty who did look for ways to incorporate asynchronous elements, but there is that focus heavily on the Socratic method, on discussion, on that sort of live understanding and adaptation of understanding that you want to give quick feedback. You don't want students to go down the wrong path. Yeah. But I do think, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity for a blended approach as we move forward to train the faculty to effectively use these tools in the classroom. So I think that's going to be another um, segue that I know Emily and I are focusing on is to really get them to understand the tools and incorporate them into the curriculum. Well, as a matter of fact, there's a question that did come up. That's a good one. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, how many of you will be continuing hybrid instruction as a regular option? Will you continue to train faculty as you did either uh, before, either as the new norm or part of some large disaster sudden hybrid planning, uh, which is what I just re suggested. You know, um, I mean, now that people have had a taste of the greater accessibility of of uh, online learning, are some people going to turn around and demand it or or strongly request it? Be they faculty who don't who are comfortable teaching from their uh, from, from their homes or, or students who who have uh, kids or situations or some or the need for that sort of accessibility. I'm looking forward to it. I'm definitely going to start planning some more hybrid and online training for our faculty, um, mostly because we've implemented technology that gathers learner analytics. And so I think that can provide a lot of feedback to our faculty as to why something is working and why it's not working and give them a little more direction instead of just uh, saying, this is what everybody's doing, you should try it. We can actually point to their data in their courses and what their student performances are measured against the learning outcome of the class. Can you talk a little bit more about those learning analytics just briefly? I'm curious, that, that always tweaks my curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we fully implemented ExamSoft. So one of the um, 
points of data is going to be that ExamSoft shows a lot of information. You can map it out to the course learning outcome with the syllabus and every question that tests towards those learning outcomes. Um, we, we, I'm also partnering with our, um, uh, our bar prep course and our first year's academic mastery courses. So those professors, I'll be working with them to measure the, the two bumpers of the students coming in and um, how they perform when they're about to leave and take the bar exam. Um, other points of uh, analytics would be coming from our school's database. Um, we have PeopleSoft here, so what their test scores when they come in and uh, how well they perform. And, and we'll just keep measuring them all along and I'll, uh, I'll be as much of a Google person as I can with all of my analytics and student performance. So I'm looking forward to that with uh, the implementations that we've done over the year. Pepperdine's always been a value-added place, and Hong is really doing a, a, a great job delivering uh, on that promise. Uh, uh, our, uh, you know, our dean wants it to be a place where people can come in uh, and expect that when they go out, they can get they can pass the bar and they can get a job, and um, and that doesn't happen without being able to prove. Uh, that we're doing something while we're here. So I really appreciate everything that Hong's been doing to drive those numbers. Cool. Last question. It's a quick one. Both. Go ahead. All right. Um, somebody asked. They they noticed. I think this is for the Pepper Dent folks. You had a front and back camera in your setup. When the students mm -hmm. had to answer questions, did they have to walk to a spot in the room to be seen on the camera? Theoretically, no. Um, uh, you know, uh, the the hope is well. It all has to do with the individual room and the individual space we have available. The hope was that we were able to produce a high enough fidelity image. Um, you know, 1080p, right, 60 frames a second um, of the classroom space at a decent angle. And um, there, 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 we knew that that wouldn't be perfect, particularly in the back rows or in the corners, you know, that the camera, particularly in those wide angle cameras, is going to pick up some weird stuff um, in, in trying to identify someone. And that's why we felt like if you were in the remote room, if for nothing else than a... Um, uh, nod to academic advantage. We were talking about moving the faculty back and forth every session. So they would be in one classroom, one session and one class member, because we really care about not having these people dished off in a, a separate room. But the bottom line is, is it may require a little bit of help to identify the specific student who's talking because you may have difficulty making their face out terribly well, but their presence, their, their, no, but their presence is there. And the fact that someone's raising their hand or moving around or, 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 or responding to something and yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it is there. And it was really the only way to solve the problem of how many people you can fit in a certain space based upon the, the rules that they were handing us. So, you know, it, and Excellent. oh, oh. And it was also great because if the faculty was sick or tested positive, they could teach from home and run Zoom in both classrooms. Or if a student wasn't able to be there because they tested positive or were sick, they could sit at home and watch the what was going on in the classrooms also in Zoom. So it's still, because Zoom is the core of it, it still ended up working out. Yep. yep. We loved it for uh, snow days when we had really incredible- <laughs> We have so many snow days in Malibu, as you well know. Uh, yeah, forest fire days. Yeah, yeah forest fire days. <laughs> Exactly. Very good, folks. Thank you so much for that. Um, I know it was the last session of the day, and so people are uh, hanging in there. Appreciate the audience for hanging in there. We still got quite a crowd. Um, so that's it. We got a little break, and then uh, we got a reception in a few minutes. Be sure to uh, crack open something, your your beverage of choice, and see you in uh, 15 minutes, or actually about 10 minutes, um, for the uh, three wishes. And, and bring your wishes. Bye, all. <laughs>